We all know, don't we, that this pandemic has really shaken things up. Certainties have been challenged. Our securities have been examined. Our, our values, well, they've been exposed. So in the collapse of so much, what is it we actually trust in as Christians? Is Christianity simply the box we tick when we're asked on a form, what religion are you? Or is it deeply rooted in us? so that when things fall apart, the center holds. This mini-series, We Believe, is designed to remind us of that center. And we're using two of the great creeds of the early church to help us, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, which begins, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe. The creed tells me that I don't believe on my own. I hold these things with others. We belong to a community of faith, a tradition going way back. Our age is one of hyper-individualism, where I do my own thing, believe my own truth. Well, the creed challenges that sort of perspective. The thing that I've missed most as a Christian through these long months of COVID lockdown is singing the songs of faith with others, looking around a congregation, sharing the same space and the same faith, proclaiming as we do, this is what we believe. This is our faith the faith of our ancestors, the faith we want to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Of course, sometimes faith has to survive in isolation. That's the way many Christians around the globe have had to manage. But the fact is, we need the hugs and the handshakes of the saints, the in-person, the we-believe experience. Now, last week, Miles took us through an Old Testament psalm to illustrate the first line of the creed. This week, it's the second line. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. And to illustrate that, we've got a song from the New Testament. Verses 15 to 20 of Colossians 1 are probably an early Christian hymn to Jesus. And it's not a fluffy worship song where you repeat one line endlessly. No, this is a song packed with big truths about Jesus. So here's the first big truth. Jesus is Lord of the cosmos and creation. Roman coins carried an image of the emperor, which made them legal tender, gave them authority. Our own sterling currency is stamped with a physical image of Elizabeth II, a likeness of her. In similar ways, Jesus is the image of God. Not physically, for, for God is spirit. Jesus is the image, the exact likeness in human form of God as a, a moral, rational, personal being. Therefore, he carries the authority of God. Jesus makes the invisible God visible. Do you remember the days before the pandemic when you could visit some of our great ancient buildings like cathedrals? Often there'd be a magnifying mirror on the floor to help the tourist appreciate the details of the high vaulted ceilings way above them. Well, that's Jesus' role. He's the mirror at ground level, perfectly reflecting the greatness of God. As we look at him, we see God. But Jesus is more than a representation of God. Take that image of the queen on a banknote. It's actually a picture of her as she was quite a few years ago. So that image is, is really a snapshot, a reminder. But Jesus is much more than that. He is God in every way, perfectly, eternally. And what this hymn says next, he is God supremely, preeminently, 
The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, Paul is not saying there that Jesus is the first thing created by God. Listen to the next verses. For in him, all things were created. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Do you see? Jesus is the creator God, not a creation of God. He enjoys the preeminent status in creation. Now, now this divine identity is what the Nicene Creed is driving at. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. And it's because Jesus is God, the only begotten Son of the Father, that we can sing. Nothing that exists, exists without Jesus. And everything that exists, exists because of him and for him. Butterflies and waterfalls, gigantic galaxies and ocean depths. Without Jesus, no gravity. Planets would collide. Particles would implode. Jesus is the point of coherence for absolutely everything. Your breath this morning, your body, this sofa on which I'm sitting, the wonderful day that I can see outside through the windows there. Jesus is what holds all of that together. In physics, there's been a long search for something called the unified theory of everything. The framework that explains how all of matter, life, the fields and forces of nature can coexist. According to the New Testament, the principle of the unified theory is not a mathematical equation, but a person. That's the reason we discover intelligent design in creation. It's what makes science possible in the first place. There is a wisdom, a rationality, an order in the universe, and that wisdom is Jesus. Now, if you were a first century Jew or Greek, the shock of this song is that this man whom Christians claimed to be God with skin on was actually crucified by the powers of Rome and buried by the powers of death. But listen to the song. All things in heaven and on earth whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities were created by him and for him. Do you see what we're being told? Jesus has power over all the powers. Wow. That changes the way that Christians look at human powers like the state or multinational corporations or the spiritual forces of evil that animates the world. But how do we know that Jesus has all power? Well, not only is Jesus Lord of the cosmos and creation. Here's the second big truth from verse 18. Christ is Lord of the church and the new creation. Jesus is head of the church, which is his body. Creation is not his body. The stars and planets are, are not his body. We, his people, and we alone in all the universe are his body. And that tells me that Jesus is intimately involved in our life, passionately committed to our future, so much so that Jesus gave himself up for the church. As her head, Jesus is over his church in wisdom and truth. And by his spirit, he is in his church as the source of her life. Jesus, says the hymn, is the beginning of the church and the firstborn from the dead. How did the church start? Why has the Christian faith made such an incredible impact upon the world? The resurrection of Jesus. That's how.
That's why. And that's what Paul means by the phrase, he's the firstborn from the dead. The reason for the Christian church is the empty tomb. Something big had to have happened to explain the church's existence. In my life so far, I've seen only one of the seven natural wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon. If you've been there, you'll know for yourself, it's an extraordinary experience to stand several miles above the Colorado River and look down as it snakes its way through the canyon. No one knows how that remarkable structure was formed. But one thing is for sure. It wasn't the result of somebody dragging a stick behind them. Something very big is needed to explain the Grand Canyon. So it is with the Christian church. A massive force must have brought it into being. And that force is the resurrection of Jesus. Now that word firstborn carries another meaning. Through his resurrection, Jesus is the firstborn, the pioneer of a new humanity and a new creation. His resurrection guarantees ours. He is the breaker of chains, pulling us and the cosmos after him towards a new world. God is designing the future around Jesus. One day, every knee will bow to him. That's not true yet, but it will be. At the end of time, God will reconcile all things to and in Jesus. Nature will be liberated. No more pandemics. No more rulers, powers and authorities with their evil agendas. There'll be food and water and vaccines for all the world equally. Justice for everyone. And how will this reconciliation be achieved? Well, verse 20 in our passage is the answer. Through him to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The shalom, the peace of God, is the result of the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross. For the cross is the road that God travels to reconcile us. And not just humanity, all things. That dislocated world, a broken planet, damaged nature will be healed and restored in the death of Christ. God has pacified the cosmos and will bring it back to him. Because of the cross, a new creation is on the way under the reign of Christ. Well, with all this big truth, let's finish with some key applications. Here's the first. All I need is Christ. Jesus is the all-sufficient Savior and Lord. Now, that is never more important to believe than in the chaos of a pandemic. All we need is Christ. This Christ. The Christ who holds all things together. The Christ around whom the future is being built. All we need is Christ. That's probably the main reason that Paul wrote this letter. For Christians in Colossae were being led to believe Jesus isn't enough for your spiritual life. You need more. You need fullness. Now, fullness was one of the buzzwords in the culture of the day. The mystery religions traded on it. They offered access to the power of fullness it was believed to be available through intermediaries in the spiritual world. Sparks of light, uh, angelic beings that were scattered through the universe. And they channeled the divine to people. So you got in touch with the gods through these spirit guides, these intermediaries. You plugged into their access points. Jesus could only take you so far, the false teachers were saying. But then 
You needed these thrones and powers, these rulers and authorities. They'd give you the whole nine yards of fullness. Now do you see what Paul is driving at in verse 19? Listen. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. And Paul will say something similar in chapter 2 and verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. My friends, what do we believe? We believe that Jesus is enough. We don't need spirit guides, crystals, auras, chakras, special insight and experiences. Everything we truly need of God is available to us in Christ. Now, that has profound implications for our lives as Christians in a multicultural, multi-faith society. We must proclaim with love, but also with clarity, the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is Lord. He is both fully God and fully human. And he fully reveals God to us and brings us fully into the life of God. Those cosmic powers were all created by Jesus. He is supreme over them. Therefore, we don't need to go through intermediaries to get to God. Jesus is all you will ever need, for he is the Lord of the cosmos and creation. Now, we cannot surrender the ground at this point. We believe in Jesus. We believe in his real incarnation. We believe in his real death in our place. We believe in his real bodily resurrection. And we therefore believe that salvation is found in no other name. There is no other way to the fullness of God but through knowing Jesus. All we need is Christ. Now, if that's the first key application... Here comes the second. All the church needs is Christ. Because Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body, he's all we need as church. It is to him and to no one else that the church owes obedience. The truth of Jesus calls the shots, not the state, not the culture. No one. And nothing must be higher than Jesus. That means that Jesus and Jesus only is the one who holds lands down together. The trustees and elders and staff don't hold lands down together. The members don't. I don't. Only the name of Christ can hold us together and keep us on the same page. For Jesus is the reference and integration point of our life, not a particular tradition or style of worship. Our unity is in him, and that's a unity wide enough to embrace all who love the Lord Jesus, regardless of their background, culture, or education. Listen, we don't build unity around our traditions or structures. We build it on and around Jesus. Lansdowne belongs to him. Only Jesus is great enough and, and big enough to keep us together. Music styles can't. Bible versions can't. Views on baptism or the gifts of the Spirit can't. So, my friends, let's make it about Jesus and Jesus only. The NIV, the King James Version of the Bible, the ESV, they don't save us. The form of church government, the model of the church can't save us. None of those things can reconcile us to God. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. 
The church then depends upon Christ for everything. The church belongs to Christ, not to a denomination or a leader. I've been thinking this week of the many tragic lessons that we need to learn and repent of from the fall of Ravi Zacharias. One of them is this. Leaders are sinful, broken, human people. They will let us down, sometimes in the most disturbing ways. Another thing I guess I've learned is this, that I'm not sure it's, it's a good idea to allow any organization or anything to be named after you. Only Jesus Christ is worthy of that. All the church needs is Christ. We cannot depend upon human, broken, fallen leaders. All the church needs is Christ. His name and glory, his power and authority, his gospel of repentance and forgiveness. And here's the third application to finish with. All of life is to be lived for Christ. All of life is to be lived for Christ. If Jesus is, is Lord of time and space, of every blade of grass, every mountain and galaxy, every throne and ruler, then we are to relate all of life to him and live all of life for him. This means that, that Christians should not be living in little ghettos or holy huddles, but living for Jesus in the bowls or rugby club, in the lecture hall, in the boardroom, in the allotment society. There's to be no secular sacred divide. For music, art, science, sport, technology can all be lived under the lordship of Christ and for the glory of God. So here's the question. Do I see my work as a context in which Christ is Lord? Does it make a difference to my parenting, to my employment, that I'm a Christian? How do I express my sexuality as I live under the Lordship of Christ? And what about my attitudes to time and, and money and, and the other gifts that God deposits into my life every day? Is Jesus Lord of my spending, of my home, of my weekends? Because God's realm is not just church, prayers, Bible reading, worship songs, Christian conventions. He is Lord of my responsibilities, Lord of my bank account, my dreams, my ambitions, Lord of my hopes and plans. We believe then in Jesus Christ. But which Jesus? The Jesus of this song? In which case, Jesus is Lord of Monday to Saturday and not just Sunday. For if Jesus is the one who created and sustains everything, if Jesus is the one who holds it all together, if Jesus has made peace for us with God through the cross, if Jesus is the one around whom the future is being built, then why wouldn't you believe and trust in Jesus? We'd be fools not to. So as I wrap up this morning, don't be a fool. Believe in Christ. Make him the center of your life so that when things fall apart, that center will hold. Jesus, the Lord of the cosmos, the head of the church, and the reconciler of the new creation, the one who makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. We believe in Jesus.